Hey guys. Welcome back to Ford Farming. I like your cows, Becca. Those are pretty. This is, oh, it's so hard to see. That's Iris and Tiana and Felicity. What about the one behind Felicity? The black cows that don't, they don't fit your mold. She's black and white. (laughs) No, that's rude. She's not mine. It's it's purple tag though. (laughs) Okay, so if you're not watching us on YouTube, this probably doesn't make any sense, but I've been changing. I told Amber I was going to change my background every time we recorded and I've done a good job. So like later in the episode during our interview, I've got turkeys in the background and you're going to want to see it. Mm -hmm. And I I finally figured out how to do it too. And so now we're just... Now we're just some floating heads. Um, You're like swimming in a sea of cranberries. Yeah, there's a truck full of cranberries behind my head. (laughs) Anyway, how's it going? It's going good. Man, we needed the sunshine today. Mm -hmm. This weekend? Ooh, this weekend was nice. Yeah, I opened the windows and it was glorious. Today was like, this morning was pretty gross out. It was really windy and cloudy here. And so like the wind chill had to have been in the twenties, but then the sun came out and like the wind just calmed down just, just enough to make it beautiful out. Mm -hmm. Today was super nice. Porter and I went for like an hour long walk with my mom this afternoon. And I was like, boy, we got to go outside because it's going to be winter again this week. (laughs) Someone posted about like how glad they were that spring was here. I was like, yeah, for like three days. (laughs) Yeah. You just jinxed it. (laughs) It's not enough. (laughs) Well, I saw it's supposed to be like 65, but thunderstorms on Wednesday. Yeah, we're in a risk for severe weather. Also, then, look at us talking about the weather after we just said <laughs> that. We just said. About that. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry, there's nothing else to talk about. Oh, yeah, That's how my life is. I don't have anything else to so, talk about. Has Barry eaten any mushrooms this week? Oh, uh, no, no. Mm-hmm. I haven't put any out yet. I'm saving oh. them for Easter. I'm putting him in Porter's Easter basket. So he's got two mushrooms. Mm, what did he eat? Mm, I don't know. But uh, but Dan and I have, uh, we're, we're the food gods to bear. So anytime we're like in the kitchen making something or sitting at the table and like we just get full, like we distract bear and then we just like throw stuff on the ground for him. So he doesn't see it coming directly from us. So we're always like, oh, bear, lucky you, the food gods have blessed you tonight or something stupid like that. But he's smart enough to have figured it out that it comes from us. So he always just sits in, he follows us to the kitchen and um, just sits at our feet all the time. And now Porter's the new mini food god too. So it didn't take him long to figure out to sit underneath a high chair for snacks. Sorry, I got a lot going on here. <laughs> the kids are both outside with Joey because he had to, I forgot to remind him that we had to record this. Um, and so he wanted to get a load of poop hauled. And so I was like, when you were asked if I was ready, I was like, well, let's do this. It's all three kids and the dog are inside, but it's fine. But then they decided to go outside. So I just had Jackson next to me and he's eating and making funny noises. And then Gracie is underneath me. She's tied up because she like, she like jumps on top of Joe's high chair to steal his food. (laughs) Um, So yeah, we have to tie her up now while we're eating. Um, It didn't take her long to figure that out. (laughs) Oh God, no. Yeah. The the first day she like didn't do anything. And I think the second day she realized like sometimes he drops food. And then by the third day, she was like, oh, my God, if I, like, just reach a little bit, I can get to him. <laughs> Smart girl. Oh, my yeah. goodness. Oh, you're fine. Well, we have a FedEx truck here right now, and it's 6 wow. o'clock Working at night. Time. Yeah, so if you hear bear barking, he's protecting the house. Gracie just nibbled my toes. Anyway, how was your week? Other than it being... A roller coaster of weather. Yep. There he is. <laughs> Come here. Um, it was good. It was good. What did we do? Um, both the kids had. Oh no, that was not. Both the kids had dentist appointments today. How'd that Sophia, go? Sophia loves the dentist. Absolutely loves it. It's super strange. Um, Joe, on the other hand, the last time we went, he was with me, and he was. Uh, <laughs> 
poor Amber had to mute herself. Um, Joel like won't even let the dentist like look at his teeth. So I was really worried how today was going to go. Um, but Sophia went first and like he kind of watched the whole time. And then finally when it was his turn, he was like very hesitant to go up. But Sophia held his hand. She was such a good mama, mama bear. And uh, he did a good job. He, he did a good job. They mainly bribed him with uh, toys. So after he got done, they got to go pick out of their toy chest that they have. And they were very excited about that. Joe took like three things. And I was like, Joe, you can probably only have one. And the dentist was just like, no, nope, he sat for the whole thing. Like he can take as many as he wants. And I was like, I probably wouldn't tell him that. But next time um, he's just going to take the whole thing with it. Right. They, yeah, they did really good. And I had Jackson with too, because Joey was busy out in the field. So we just, we handled it. We did good. Good. Uh, yeah, our FedEx guy is here and, and Dan let the dog out because uh, he didn't know FedEx was here. So Bear just chased our poor FedEx guy back into oh. his van and he didn't want to come out. Because... <laughs> Did he drop the package off yet? No, he like opened the door to get out and saw Barry running at him. <laughs> back in his van. Oh no, is Dan oh. going to go help him? Yeah, <laughs> he's out there. Now they're best friends. Bear has a very big bark, but he's just a dumb idiot. So he's... He's fine, but it's just kind of funny to see. <laughs> oh, poor bear. A guy. <laughs> he's trying to get his stuff done. And... Well, and like, yeah, I mean, he's a big dog. If he was coming barreling at you, I'd probably run back in my truck, too. Yeah. Oh, oops. Sorry, guy. I just, I ordered stuff from Target, and I got some, I got some new pillows for the couch. <laughs> oh. Because bear lays on our old ones, so flatten them out like little pancakes. Hello. Is that good pizza? He's so happy. We went to uh, Zoli's on our way home because mm. bribery, you know, bribery works. Um, got from Zoli's. They got really good pizza, and it's on sale right They now do. Like eight something, eight forty nine, or I don't know. Have you had their sandwiches, or it's like in a garlic breadstick? No, that sounds. They good have one. like chicken parm sandwiches, where it's like inside a breadstick, and they're really, really good. Cool. We don't go there very often. Usually just for the pizza because it's fast and it's I like that you can like order it and then just pick it up. It's in a weird location in Dubuque, but it's like kind of on our way home. So I feel like everything in Dubuque is kind of in a weird location. That's a valid point, yeah. Did I tell you about the time when I was working down in Iowa Dot Quad Cities? I went to the Dairy Queen in Dubuque when you just come right over the bridge. Oh yeah, there's like a Dairy always. Queen. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's right next to it. So they were having um, a Jurassic Park blizzard. This is like when the new Jurassic Park came out the one with Chris Pratt. And on my way down to Iowa, um, I wanted to stop and get one. And the guy, the kid like went to go hand me my blizzard through the window and he like tipped it upside down. And I waited like 20 minutes for the stupid blizzard and it just exploded all over my truck. <laughs> How embarrassing. Did they remake it? Yeah, he did. I'm, he's like, oh, I've never had that happen before. I'm like, yeah, I get that a lot. <laughs> so I'm I'm a little jaded about Dubuque just because. <laughs> hey, I just because of that. There, because they have a um, dirt Oreo dirt cake one. Like, so it's got, it's like chocolate and it's got Oreo and then it's got the gummy worms in it. Like, you know, the, the cups. Mm -hmm. That sounded really good, but um. And we had a little bit of time to wait before our pizza was ready, but I really didn't feel like feeding the kids ice cream right after the dentist. So I that's probably the best time to do it. Yeah, well, maybe. Well, they picked out um they got like Italian ices from Fazoli's. Oh. I was like, I probably don't need to like really overload the sugar. And I knew if I only got one, that would be rude. <laughs> so I'll just stop there another time because I bet that one's really good. All you have to do is you just have to eat it and, and they when they ask for you to try it, just be like, no, no, no. It's spicy. <laughs> don't fall for that though. Really? Yeah. Your kids are too smart. Yeah, yeah, it's unfortunate. Um anyways, what what you got going on the marsh this week? Anything exciting? Um, nothing really, just because it's so cold, everything is still flooded back up. Like when it's cold and like, especially when it's really windy, you make sure that they're flooded and protected. So there's not really a whole lot going on right now. 
Um, I think the guys are just like trimming trees and picking up sticks today. Like it wasn't anything super fun. Um, so still just kind of shop work. Needs to be done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Before ugh, I'm just excited for the grass to start growing again so I can start mowing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I need to get out of the house. I need to, I, I'm going a little stir crazy. I was telling Joey, we almost need to mow ours because last fall, it was a pretty warm fall. And mm-hmm. like, we almost should have cut it one more time. So it was like pretty long when it turned gross. Um, but now it's like just starting to to turn green, but there's just like a, a lot of dead long stuff. So I told them we should probably mow it at some point. I think maybe after this week with the rain, when it's going to be really warm. Oh, yeah. Maybe, maybe next, in the next week or two, I hope. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, before this intro gets to be like 30 minutes long, <laughs> we have a fun guest tonight. Um, I think uh, we kind of go over how we, how we found Emma um when we jump into the interview but Emma um I actually went to high school with Emma she is super great um and if you are interested in FFA or if you were in 4-H as a kid and not FFA this is a great way um Emma's great at explaining what the program is all about um how to get involved if you're not in FFA um even as an adult Uh, so there's a lot of really good things covered tonight so hopefully this answers some of your questions. Hopefully it gets you a little excited about the program. Um, and if you are in high school, um, maybe consider joining. Or if you're an adult, maybe talk to your kids about joining um, as a way to stay involved because it is um, much larger than egg, which is something I wasn't, I wasn't really familiar with. So let's just jump right into the interview with Emma. You enjoy. Hey guys, I'm really excited for our guest today. Um, I think last season, Becca and I were talking about something revolving around FFA and uh, we didn't know how to answer our own question. And all of a sudden, Emma just slid in our DMs and she's like, hey, I listened to this episode and if you guys ever want to talk about FFA, let me know. Well, Emma, we let you know. So here you are to talk about FFA with us. So um, guys, please welcome Emma Huber to the podcast. Um, Emma, welcome. Thank you. So do you want to start off by just introducing yourself? Tell us where you're from, what you do, um, how you got to be where you are today. So I'm Emma Huber, and I am originally from Toma, which is where I teach egg now, which is pretty cool. Um, So as part of being an egg teacher, it also makes me automatically the FFA advisor. Um, I've been teaching for six years and been in Toma for five years, which is neat. Um, But kind of like my personal life, my husband and I, we have a farm outside of Wisconsin Dells. Um, So we're really busy with like our horses and chickens and goats and sheep and beef cows. Um, And Becca, I think you just got an Aussie and I have one too. So his name is Tater and he's sitting here wondering what I'm doing on my computer. Um, But I've had um, the opportunity to work with the National FFA organization ever since I joined FFA when I was in 10th grade. Um, And I've served as a state officer after I graduated from high school and then in a couple different facets over the last couple of years um, beyond just my role as an FFA advisor in Toma. So a lot of FFA realm in my life. That's pretty impressive. I'm not going to (laughs) lie. So did you know kind of when you first started FFA, like this is what you wanted to do when, when you quote unquote grew up? Um, Not really. I was really hesitant, actually, to join FFA when I was in high school. I didn't take an egg class until I was a sophomore in high school. Um, I was a horse girl. I grew up competing in rodeo. And I always like there's like this thing where like horse people aren't necessarily like egg people. So um, but once I took my first class, I just like jumped head in and I took advantage of like all the opportunities I could be a part of. And so I knew that I loved FFA, but I didn't necessarily think that I would be an egg teacher until I ended up in college and didn't like what I was going to school for. So then it made me round back and my egg teacher said, well, duh, we knew you were going to do that. (laughs) So did you grow up on any sort of farm or were you just mostly um, horses and, and rodeo? 
Um, I grew up in town, but my grandparents had a farm. So I've had horses and like been on the farm my whole life. Um, but I didn't actually have my own farm or have horses at my house until I got married and Josh and I have our farm. That's pretty exciting. That's cool. That's a cool story how that all came through. So um, I guess, do you kind of want to explain to the folks out there, myself included, that weren't involved in FFA, like what the organization is all about and kind of what you teach in school? Yeah, so FFA is a national organization for students in seventh through 12th grade who are interested in some facet of agriculture. So I always teach my students that FFA used to be Future Farmers of America, but 35 years ago, actually, they changed their name to the National FFA Organization. And the reason being is that FFA is for more than future farmers. So like a common like slang is FFA used to be for cows, plows, and sows, but the modern FFA is for beakers, speakers, and job seekers. So it's, it's just a wider variety. Anyone can join FFA and there's a whole lot of opportunities for students in public speaking and learning about modern technologies, but there's also still those production egg students or those more stereotypical um, farming kids. There's room for them in FFA too. So we have different events that um, you would either consider at like the chapter and then in Wisconsin, we call it like the next level is district and then section and then state. So similar to like sports, um, a lot of times you're going to have like your first level of contests in the at the chapter level and then you move on to district sectionals and then state. And so there's anything from like speaking contests, which we call leadership development events, where students are like memorizing the FFA creed or Um, practicing parliamentary procedure by running a meeting to um, then we have career development events which are like typically known as judging contests so like your dairy cattle judging or um, vet science has their own judging contest so there's a lot of like opportunities for students to grow beyond what a lot of people originally thought was future farmers of America it's a big picture now I guess I think that's such a big misconception that like if you didn't grow up on a farm or you're not part of agriculture, you're like not welcome in FFA. And almost the same goes for 4-H too. Like it's like there's so much more to 4-H than just the egg side of it. And I think a lot of people sometimes don't realize that. I agree. And I also think that because now like I I don't have a lot of experience with 4-H, but specifically in FFA, because we're so focused on like the modern technologies and the speaking contests and different things like that, the leadership portions of it, we have to remind ourselves, like we have to keep including the production egg side of it because we don't want to lose those students' interests either. Um, Because a lot of times those are the students that need like the leadership skills. Maybe they're never going to leave the farm. So if we can give them a little bit of like customer service or something, it will help them along the way. But I agree. And I also like, I always think, I mean, like we're all women, but agriculture in general is like the good old boys club. And so a lot of people think that there aren't any girls or there aren't any female egg teachers. And in FFA right now, there's about 60% of our leadership positions. So like um, the chapter officer teams and state officer teams are women or are girls. So that's pretty cool. That is. Do they still do forensics in high school? Uh, Some high schools do, yeah. I'm just thinking, like, that's kind of uh, not similar. You know, Mm -hmm. FFA is more like leadership, but I was in forensics once upon a time. Are you like, big deal. I don't know why, (laughs) because I hate, like, public speaking and stuff. So maybe that's why I hate it. (laughs) It scarred me for life. Um, So if a student wants to be involved in FFA, I know it's not at every school. Um, like my school growing up didn't have it. And I, we tried to get it started at our school, but we had a very, um, not rural community and they kind of cared more about sports and anything else than, uh, trying to get an FFA started. So they put a squash to that pretty quick. But if, a, if someone wanted to join, I know my senior year, I joined at a different school, but I feel like I didn't get the full experience of it just because I wasn't at that school. But I guess, what can they expect? Like, do you have to take a certain amount of egg classes or like how do your meetings go? Is it similar 
at every school or is it just depending? So it kind of depends at the different schools what their requirements are. But from National FFA, they tell us that in order to be like an active FFA member, you have to have an egg class at least one a year. Um, but schools are on all different schedules. So like some schools have quarter long classes. Some schools are on trimesters now. Um, and so depending on what their school system is set up like, it's especially hard for like juniors to get into egg classes because they're like working on all those AP classes and making sure that they have an easy course load their senior year. Um, and so some schools are going to be more lenient with that, but they're supposed to have at least one egg class a year. And then every school is lenient on, or not lenient, every school is different on the amount of teachers they have or the amount of classes that they offer. So in Toma, where I teach, there's two of us. So I teach seventh and eighth grade. Um, and I have a variety of classes that my students at seventh and eighth grade get to take. And then I teach high school animal science classes. And then my co-teacher, she teaches um all of the rest of the classes so like natural resources horticulture um any of our like biotechnology classes at the high school um but not every school has two teachers so they might be more limited on the amount of classes they can teach and we're pretty unique in the fact that I'm like two-thirds at the middle school so I see a ton of middle schoolers where some other districts don't see students until they're in ninth grade and do only FFA members take those classes or are they open to everyone? So that's a little bit different depending on the school too. So at my school, like everyone's required to take agriculture when they're in seventh grade as an exploratory class. That's um, awesome. As like, <laughs> it should be like uh, that at every school. I agree. So everyone takes it in seventh grade for nine weeks in like a rotation with their like art class and health class, et cetera. But um, not every school has that, but the same is um, the same is like, uh, can you tell me your question again? Check me that like remember it. Oh, can not a kid. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the, at, like, so at my school, everyone's required to, so they're not all going to be an FFA. Um, and at the high school, it's same too, I think. Between the middle school and the high school, my co-teacher and I, we see like 525 students a year, which is really cool. Um, mm -hmm. But we have like 140 students in FFA. So cool. they're not all in FFA, but some schools then they have what's called affiliated membership. And I think that like as a whole, we're moving towards that. So then every student who takes an egg class is automatically an FFA member. And there's pros and cons to it, but the big pro to it is that students who might not have money to pay for those FFA dues don't have to worry about it. But also, if a student decides this time of year that they want to compete in a contest because or any FFA event because it sounds interesting, they can because they're automatically a member, even though they miss the March 1st sign up. So at March 1st, we have to have our rosters due. So if I have anyone this time of year that's like, oh, I want to go to Midwest Horse Fair with you next week, they can't because they're technically not an FFA member if they didn't sign up before. Hmm. Well, yeah, and you wouldn't want to necessarily take that opportunity away from a student who had signed up. Right. Previously. Yeah. Hmm. So it just depends. What do you guys do at the Midwest Horse Fair then? Um, I'm taking one of my class. I teach a class called horse dairy and livestock science. And so I'm taking a group of like 30 ish students with me down there in a couple weeks. And we're just gonna like, they'll have like a list of things they have to try out during the day. So they'll have to go talk to a couple different vendors in the Alliant Energy Center, and they'll have to watch at least one show or like one class of a show. They'll have to go see a workshop. They'll have to like walk through a couple different barns and take selfies with horses. I just like make things funny. I, a lot of times I'll give my students like, a, like when we go to World Dairy Expo or Midwest Horse Fair, I'll give them like a photo scavenger hunt they have to complete so that they can put all those in a slideshow and we can look at them when we get back. Oh, that's awesome. Fun. <laughs> it's fun to do. So how but many events like, like more engaging too then? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Amber. No, you're fine. How many events like that do you typically go to in a year? Um, 
I mean, like Midwest Horse Fair and World Dairy Expo, those are like two big events we do in Madison. But I would say in any typical month, it's pretty common for us to have anywhere from like five to 10 FFA events. So what, like, like what? <laughs> um, okay, so like <laughs> everything. Um, this month, my students, so, or let's do March, for example. So the beginning of March, my students had their sectional speaking contests. So those were students who already qualified for that level. They went to that. Um, we had our like chapter meeting. So just like our general like membership meeting, um, we had an event called Build a Bed, which was like a community service project we did with the Toma Lions Club. We had our Toma FFA alumni um, banquet. So they had a banquet and we'd had students go there. Um, oh, and we had... Um, our UW Platteville hosted a career development events, which is the judging contest. So we were down there. And then we also had practices for all of those things. So um, we had like 7.15 a.m. practices for my Parley Pro team and 3.30 practices for my Quiz Bowl team. And then we had practices all over the board for our five different judging teams that went to Platteville. We so had de- terrible weather for that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was inside. So thankful for that. Oh, that's good. Uh, one of the girls that helps me feed calves was uh, helping out with like the horse judging thing. And I was like, do you have to be in an outside arena for this? She's like, no, we're in the barn. I'm like, okay, that makes it a little bit better. <laughs> so do you have to plan all of these events yourself or do you have help kind of? Because that's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. Um, So theoretically, it's a student leadership organization. So I try to put as much into their hands as I can. And especially when it comes to, I mean, seventh graders aren't going to be able to plan a community service event by themselves, but with the right guidance, they can put most of it together. And if you ask them to do really hard things, they'll figure it out. Um, And then when it comes to like, we have a 10 person high school officer team. So that's a lot of kids to complete tasks. So it just takes, we have like, not we have like, we do have weekly FFA officer meetings. So every Thursday morning, we have a meeting that my co-teacher and I come into with a to-do list and we separate the officers out into different groups and they start planning different things. So it is a lot of work. um, And a lot of egg teachers aren't lucky enough to have two advisors at their school. Um, to help balance some of that but theoretically the students do most of it because it's their organization so sometimes I just have to remind myself to like step back and if it fails it fails (laughs) because it's not mine to own that's really cool oh sorry go ahead (laughs) Do, do a lot of the students then continue um into collegiate FFA at their school or do do a lot of schools have which I know Platteville did no, oh, I don't. So they're they're kind of going away or they're like rebranding themselves. Um, Platteville had, I went to Platteville too. Um, so Platteville had the collegiate FFA, but I think now it's morphed itself into an egg ed society, which is the same thing that River Falls has. Um, and so I think a lot of them go on to college in their active in different organizations within their universities, but they're not necessarily active within a collegiate FFA anymore. But there is a program at the tech schools that FFA basically like lends into, and it's called PALS, stands for Partners in Active Leadership Support, I'm pretty sure. Um, But that is a, no, that's not right. It's PAS, I'm thinking of something different. So it's post-secondary agriculture students. Um, and so that's at all the two-year universities, which is really similar to an FFA. And we have really strong chapters of that at our two-year schools in Wisconsin. So do you guys offer a lot of scholarships then? Uh, yeah, we have a lot of scholarships through FFA. So I think National FFA gives out over $500,000 worth of scholarships. Um, but Wisconsin FFA gives out a ton of scholarships. And I know like in Tomo, we have a um, like a scholarship night where the students can apply for different scholarships and then they're recognized in the auditorium for it. 
And every year parents are like, wow, those egg kids really get a ton of scholarships and they're so amazed by it. But, and they're like, oh man, I wish I would have known that. And we're like, okay, well, it's every year. So like, <laughs> push your kids into that area. No one's telling them they can't do it. I'm, I feel like your FFA chapter is a lot bigger than it was like when we were in high school. Have you noticed a lot of growth in your chapter? Um, it, I, the program itself has like morphed itself. So it used to be like a middle school only teacher and then a high school only teacher. And a couple of years before I came up into FFA, or before I came to teach in Toma, it morphed itself into a position where now I am like a third at the high school and two thirds. So I think there is growth in our school, but I think there's growth everywhere. Um, 2020 like downed our numbers in Wisconsin FFA a little bit, but in Wisconsin, we have like 21,000 FFA members, which is pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. And we're not affiliated. Like I was talking about before, where like every student has to be in an egg class or every student in an egg class has to be an FFA. So some states that have that have like over hundreds of thousands of FFA members in their state like Texas. (laughs) You know, but it's 80 degrees in Texas right now. So we can't even, can't even say anything to them. Yeah. Texas and California are the two biggest states. That makes sense. I guess, yeah, that makes sense. It's, there's a lot of culture there. Wisconsin is still better, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Someone wanted me to ask you when you're going to get rid of pantyhose for the uniforms. <laughs> Someone was really upset about the pantyhose. <laughs> <laughs> Tough beans, man. <laughs> um, so our official FFA dress, actually, maybe five years ago or so now, they changed it because it used to be like really gender like secluded. So women's official dress had to be um, like it read that they should wear um, the knee length black skirt with the black nylons and black close toed heels. Um, and I think about five years ago, they changed that. So now it just reads um FFA official dress can include and then it lists off black slacks etc so it's kind of like a really big deal when the state and national officers started wearing black slacks as part of their official dress I'm a little bit jealous of that because when I was a state officer we wore um the black nylons and black knee length skirt and they're not easy to find so the black knee length skirts are not not an easy task to find so when I find them I buy them and I keep them for my students who want to wear them so what is like the official dress like what else do you wear besides the black so they have um like black plant back black pants black shoes and then they have to wear a white collared shirt um and then they have the blue corduroy jacket. Um, girls have like a scarf that hooks together, kind of like a fake tie in the back. And then boys have the actual, um, they have a tie. There's different versions of the scarf and the tie and you can buy them all through National Face website. Um, but I would say hands down, the hardest part is finding those stinking skirts. I think that probably turned a lot of girls off from FFA when they were, when that was still a thing. Like I have to wear a skirt. No, I'm out. (laughs) I think that a lot of the kids like complain about having to wear the official dress, but when they're not allowed to wear it anymore, they're really sad. That makes sense. (laughs) So if you could pick like, what, what's your favorite event to go to? Uh, my favorite event, both as a student and as a teacher to take students to is National FFA Convention. So it's held every, usually the last week in October, and it's in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, there is usually about like 75,000 FFA members there. Um, we didn't have it in 2021. Um, but we, no, that's wrong. We didn't have it in 2020, but we did have it back this last year in 21. And it was so fantastic to be back there because there's literally like blue jackets everywhere and all the kids are so excited to see each other. And we gather in Lucas Oil Stadium and Banker's Life Fieldhouse. Um, and so 
there's just, there's kids everywhere that all have the same interests and teachers everywhere that all have the same interests. And there's lots of fun, different sessions and workshops and like a big, like Western themed shopping mall they put together and a big expo center with like colleges and different universities and um, businesses that the students get to talk to. And for some of our kids that like, some of our kids never get out of Wisconsin growing up, but at my school specifically, there's kids that never get out of Monroe County. So having the opportunity to go all the way to Indianapolis, which for some states, it's a lot farther than a seven hour car ride, but um, for going to Indianapolis and spending five or six days there with a group of kids, it's really neat to see just like their eyes light up and then be excited about the new friends they made and the experiences they had. So that's definitely my favorite thing. That does sound really fun. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> so Emma, if, um, if you were talking to a room full of like eighth graders that had no that didn't know anything about FFA what would your pitch be to kind of sell them to come over and and give it a try I always tell my students that there's something for ever there's something for everyone in FFA so whether you want to learn more about animals or plants or natural resources whether you like to talk in front of people or think you want to learn to talk in front of people or whether you'd rather like sit at a computer and learn things that way. There's literally something fun for every single person to do in FFA. And it's my job as their FFA advisor to help them figure out what that is. And I'm bound and determined to help them figure it out. So if they're willing to show up to a meeting or to sign up to an event, I'll make sure that they have fun. And I'll also make sure that they find their specific space that they love the most. And We have so many opportunities that we are talking about earlier that like it's hard work um, as an FFA advisor or egg teacher to put on, but it's worth it because a lot of students find their place in FFA that might not find their space in sports or might not find it in another club at school. And so it always makes it worth it to see them excited about it. So that's what I always tell my kids. That's so cool. And I think Toma is super lucky to have you, especially come back home um, and just makes it feel a little bit more personalized. So you're doing, you're doing amazing work and um, I'm excited to see how you can continue to grow and, and shape all these young minds, because that's just, I learned so much just from talking to you these last few minutes. So kudos to you. (laughs) Is there anything else that we didn't talk about that you feel, um, very passionately that you just need to throw in there. (laughs) Um, I guess one last thing I'd like to include is that for students that really enjoy FFA, there's also a lot of other avenues. So like what Becca was asking about collegiate FFA. Um, So if there's other organizations they're interested in joining, um, but they can also always come back to their FFA chapters and support them similar to like a sports boosters club. Um, Not every FFA chapter has an official FFA alumni and supporters group. That's what like our sports boosters would be called FFA alumni and supporters. So they might not have an official group, but your egg teacher will never turn down any help. So if anyone listening or anyone anywhere is interested in helping their previous egg teacher or whatever town they ended up in once they became a grown up, no one is ever going to turn away your help coaching a team or helping on a field trip or anything like that. So definitely reach out and see if there's some way you can be involved if that's something you're interested in doing. Cool. I didn't know that either. You're just, Mm -hmm. you're just a little knowledge bomb over. (laughs) So before we let you go, uh, Becca, do you want to do some rapid fire questions? Oh, Jesus. Just, just Um, put everybody on the spot real quick. Okay. uh, What's your favorite item at quick trip? Um, Chicken sandwiches with mayo and pickles. Good. Okay. While we're still on quick trip, uh, brown cap or green cap? I can't drink milk. Oh, oh no! I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm so lactose sorry. intolerant, but I'm willing to make the sacrifice for ice cream, just not like a glass of milk. Yeah, that's okay. fair. That's fair. What that's What are you milk. risking it for? What kind of ice cream are you going to risk it for? Any cedar crust ice cream. 
Mm, yeah, that stuff's good. <laughs> um, uh, okay. Oh, you got one? Uh, what, what's your favorite brand of cow? <laughs> Angus. It's <laughs> what we have. <laughs> It means nothing to me when people answer these questions. I just like seeing Becca's reaction. <laughs> it's just, it's a black cow. <laughs> That's okay. Um, what's your spirit animal? A horse. Wild and free. Are, are there different, <laughs> different brands of horses? What's your brand of horse? <laughs> My favorite brand of horse is an American quarter horse. <laughs> So for the, for the horse dummies out there like me, what did those look like? What did they look like? Um, I, I don't really know how to explain it. They're really like stout and muscular. Okay. They're like your most common, like, um, like brown too, aren't they? well, they don't, they can be basically any color. Oh, <laughs> I like the paint ones. Is that what they're called? When they're like kind of speckled a little bit. They're cute. Mm-hmm. They're cute. I always like the, the Palominos. That's the only they one I know. Mm-hmm. I always wanted <laughs> to be one like tan and blonde hair. That's my kind of horse. <laughs> wow. Okay. I know you're you're really getting us. You're turning around. So. <laughs> um, let's see. If you could live in any um, time period, which one would you live in? <laughs> Um, now, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> That's fair. I mean, like, I five mean, years from now would like be cool. Have... Five years from now would be cool because then I'd, like, know, like, how everything turned out, right? <laughs> That's fair. It would hard fair. to almost go back because you, like, know so much now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's simpler times back then, but then you don't have, like, internet. <laughs> What time period would you like to live in? Um, I think like the 30s would be cool. I don't know. Okay. Is Prohibition over by then? <laughs> so these are the real important questions. <laughs> yeah. Or we're talking about Prohibition. What's your drink of choice? Um, Angry Orchard. It's been a while since I had those. Do they make different flavors or is it all apple? They make different ones. The best one is like pineapple. Ooh, really? Good. Well, they also make a cranberry one. You would like that. It's good. I'm gonna have to look for it now. Mm. Um. Okay. Oh, I was gonna ask you fresh or fried cheese curds, but I, I'm sorry. Uh, fried. Okay. <laughs> you make sacrifices for important things. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Becca, do you have one more last question? Um. No. <laughs> I think of a good one. If you had the chance to speak to any celebrity about agriculture and what you do for FFA, who would it be? Carrie Underwood. Because that would be a lot of misinformation that is shared, and I would like to show good examples. Okay, that's that's is a good answer. Vegan? Yeah, uh, I don't know, something like that. Becca, I want to know your answer now. We haven't asked that question. <laughs> um, I, I was just watching Obama, but. <laughs> I don't consider her a celebrity. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have said that. Um. <laughs> I'm just going to edit that out. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't ask it because I was thinking about it. I was just... Really, though, she would be a good one to like try to talk to because of what she did she would. to the school lunch program, but... Bring back the cookies. Bring back the cranberry juice. There's nothing. <laughs> There's nothing at school lunch. That's really sad. Okay, Who well, that was... 
I mean, I was just watching that Kardashian special. So obviously Kim Kardashian was right at the top of my brain. <laughs> I text Becca right I feel before like we came be on. To have a conversation with her. I mean, if you yeah, took her phone great. away and you just like strap her hands down behind her back or something, maybe it would be okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah. let me let me okay. reach out to her PR team and see if she wants to come on <laughs> if your people call my people mm-hmm. yeah yeah anyway <laughs> okay Emma <laughs> this has gone uh, on long <laughs> that's that's gone off the rails so thank you for taking time to come chat with us um and again you're doing great things in Toma so thank you um are you on social media do you want people to follow you uh, they can I think i'm on instagram at like mrs emma huber um i post some stuff related to school but most of my school stuff is posted through toma ffa's facebook and instagram pages so you can follow those if you want to awesome well thank you again and um you guys if you're not following us make sure you check out our facebook instagram page over at forward farming podcast we're also on youtube so if you want to come see becca's turkeys (laughs) Head on over to our YouTube channel. Check us out there. Uh, <laughs> I'm over at Cranberry Chats and Becca's over at Farming with the Hillbees. And that wraps it up for this week. And we'll see you next time. Bye.